we're going to start on page 23 of the notes um, and continue on the shut door midnight cry part two. But before we do, if you go to Ezekiel in chapter two, verse eight. It says, But thou son of man, hear what I say unto thee, be not thou re rebellious like that rebellious house, open thy mouth and eat that I give thee. Okay, and then D Dario read verses 1 through 3, I believe, and of the next, of the next chapter, chapter 3, but I want to take it up in verse 5. And I'm going to, I had this quote in from Review and Herald, March 22nd, 1887. It says, the old standard bearers knew what it was to wrestle with God in prayer and to enjoy the outpouring of his spirit. But these are passing off the stage of action and who are coming up to fill their places? How is it with the rising generation? Are they converted to God? Are we awake to the work that is going on in the heavenly sanctuary or are we waiting for some compelling power to come upon the church before we shall arouse? Are we hoping to see the whole church revived? That time will never come. There's a message that was given to the Millerites on August 11, 1820 that came down in the hand of Christ, the little book that they were to eat and they were to carry um, to that generation. So when the angel come down on September 11, 2001, he came down with the little book open in his hand, and we are to eat it. Um, and then we have a message to carry. And Ezekiel describes this message, Jeremiah describes this, this message, and John in Revelation describes this message. But notice verse 5 of chapter 3, because one of the things that is difficult about this message, but is clearly identified in the scriptures, is that you have a responsibility to take this message and carry it to the Adventist church, but the Adventist church is not going to receive this message. But you still have that responsibility. Verse 5 says, For thou art not sent to a people of a strange speech and of a hard language, but to the house of Israel, not to many people of a strange speech and of a hard language, whose words thou can, canst not understand. Surely had I sent thee, un, sent thee to them, they would have hearkened unto thee. Do you see what he's saying? If, you, if we took this message to those people outside of Adventism, they would hearken unto it. But Adventism, Israel, isn't going to hearken to it. Now, there's a couple friends of ours that live in California. They're, they're on the board of our ministry. Now, I think I've heard this story, but I don't remember the details, so I, they may be a little bit off. But over the past period of time, there was a, a sister that began staying in their home. Forget the particular crisis in her life that, that made that arrangement. But she wasn't an Adventist. And she started listening to these materials as a non-Adventist and started eating them. Okay. So I, I spoke to her once on the phone, and then the first time I ever looked at her was last night. She was here. And she began to, to explain to me the various studies that she's taken off the Internet or off the DVDs or whatever and how she's consuming this message. And I determined this morning, for whatever reason, to throw this in. And the reason I wanted to throw it in is because there's also someone in this room, and I'm not trying to pick on him. I'm trying to use him as, a, as an example. There's also a person in this room that shared with me, and I know this person has been dealing with this message for years now. Maybe not 10 years, but several years. And he gave testimony last night that he's not prepared to teach the 1290 and the 1335 time prophecy. And brothers and sisters, you have to, you have to be able to present this message. You have to eat it and then carry it to Israel. You have to. Israel's not going to hear it. Now, if you remember, we read a quote by William Miller. It says, he got stronger with every presentation. Well, William Miller is a type of both. And if you weren't here last night, we dealt with William Miller, what he was typifying. He typifies those in Adventism that received the seal of God and those in Adventism that received the mark of the beast. And in terms of him typifying those that are going to receive the seal of God, every time that William Miller presented the message, he got stronger in the message. Okay, it's, 
I'm not I'm not comparing myself with Miller Miller. I'm comparing myself with Miller Miller in the next thought because he's a type for all of us. I've experienced that. I've experienced that. I know the Lord defends this message. I can't tell you how many times I've been in a in an adversarial group of people it, who are trying to expose this message as false when they would ask a question purposely designed to prove that what I was teaching was error, and when they asked the question, I realized, oh my, I don't know how to answer that. And it does make everything look bad. And before I'm over, before I finish this, this momentary flash of how, uh oh, I'm in, a, this, I'm in the corner in front of everyone, and this message is going to be exposed, suddenly I know the answer to that question, and I know where to go to in the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy to prove why that question is invalid and why the truth is correct. That's happened to me so many times that I became convicted that the Lord made sure that happened to me so I can give this very testimony. The Lord defends this message. This is no man's message. This is his message, and he defends it. And every time you present this message, the promise is, is that you're going to get stronger in this message, but if you don't start sharing this message, if you can be in this message three or four years and not know how to present the 1290 or the 1335, there's something wrong. There's something wrong. So I was, that bothered me last night. I, admit, I was going to say something about that condition. I was going to say something about the fact that there's a sister here that's not an Adventist that is eating up this message, but I was unsure whether I was going to say that. It was just thoughts running through my head. And I walked in here this morning, and I met another sister who comes up to me and says, I'm not an Adventist. Different sister. But I want you to know I've been studying this message. The Lord brought me into this message, he said, in November, and I've been going through it over and over and over again. And she knows a lot. The Lord brought her to this message. So brothers and sisters... The Lord is preparing those people outside of Adventism to receive this message that is now swelling into a loud cry, but you don't get to participate in that glorious event if you don't start carrying this message to the house of Israel, and I'm telling you, the house of Israel is not going to receive it based upon the word of God. But you have to start doing it because it's when you get into the the pres presentation of this message that the Lord can give you more. You have to give it to receive it and where he can expand your understanding on how to defend this message. But he's not going to convert the church. That time will never come. Page 23 For the, of the notes. <coughs> For those of you that may not have been here last night, this is the, the Millerite history. We identified a shut door controversy in the Millerite history that took place after October 22, 1844. We identified William Miller as one who is representing the lost and the saved in Adventism at the end of the world. And William Miller made a progression of mistakes. William Miller is a saved man, but he's used by the Lord to typify the lost in Adventism during the Sunday Law Crisis. William Miller's progressive mistakes was, first, he, he started trusting in man. And by the way, if you, didn't, if you haven't had time to read through William Miller's dream, the most difficult time, part of that dream for me to, to get into my head is when he goes into the, to the one house where the bear's chained up and there's a dog and someone riding the dog. And one of the reasons it's difficult to wrap our minds around that, I believe, is we don't understand the issue of, issue of abolition during that time period. Here you are in the 1830s, you're approaching the Civil War, and the Christian churches in the United States, they're beginning to get militant about the fact that the slaves need to be let free. And their militancy is causing them to focus on the issue a political issue of slavery. And when William Miller's in his dream is brought into this, the message he's presenting them, to them allows them that will receive the message to move beyond the argument of the politics of the day and age and receive the message of the hour that they might be saved. That's, and that's how David Arnold gives the overview, and I think it's valid. And brothers and sisters, pardon me? 
Okay, and there's four copies of that dream left. But you know what the dog in the room today is? Because the Millerite history is repeated to the very letter. Anyone know what the dog in the room is today? It's been mentioned once. It's the conspiracy theories, brothers and sisters. Conspiracy theories are outside of Adventism. You don't have to be a Christian in the United States to be following all the conspiracies about 9-11 or Waco or Oklahoma City. There's patriot movement in the United States that are, are built upon the conspiracy theories of what's went on in the government of the United States and the New World Order and the United Nations. But those conspiracy theories, they're in the Adventist church as well. And we have our own slants. And I tell you what, as you present this message to Adventists, Adventists today, one of the biggest stumbling blocks from them receiving this, as you mentioned, is we're so caught up with wondering what the Jesuits are doing and what the New World Order is doing. And you can't know if that stuff's true. Because you teach when you're out teaching it, you're teaching that this is a manifestation of Mystery Babylon. And if it's Mystery Babylon, then you know it's cloaked in mystery. So you can't even know if it's true or not, but you, you know some of it's true. You have a general idea of it. But brothers and sisters, even if it was all true, we're Laodiceans. What we have to have at this time in Earth's history is a transformation, and the transformation takes place from consuming the word of God. And the stories about the conspiracy theories, there's no power in them even if they were true. All right? It's a diversion to prevent us from preparing a character for the seal of God. It's the dog in the room. This message will allow you to move away from that smoke screen that's in Adventism today. And as you share this message around the world, well, you may not realize it, you find what you run into more often than not. For those people that are willing to hear this kind of message, to come out and listen to it, they're generally steeped in all the voices in Adventism that are teaching the conspiracy theories. Now, I, I, the, what I wanted to start with, and I forgot, the last thing I said last night was incorrect. And as I was going down to the closing prayer, I thought, I wish I wouldn't have said it that way. It wasn't correct. I named a name. And, and towards the end, I said, the names I name are, are people in Adventism that have named me. Well, that's not true. Some of the names I name are simply people that are obviously attacking the foundations or they're attacking the shut door message and they haven't put my name with it. So I name some people that have never named me too. I want to put that in the record because I may name a few more names before we get out of here. Early writings, page 14, top of page 23 on your notes. Sister White's verse of first vision. On this path, the Advent people were traveling to the city, which was at the farther end of the path. They had a bright light set up behind them at the beginning of the path, which the angel told me was the midnight cry. This light shone all along the path and gave light for their feet so that they might not stumble. If they kept their eyes fixed on Jesus, who was just before them, leading them to the city, they were safe. But so some, soon some grew weary and said that the city was a great way off, and they expected to have entered it before. Then Jesus would encourage them by raising his glorious right arm, and from his arm came a light which waved over the Advent band, and they shouted, Alleluia. Others rashly denied the light behind them. Others rashly denied the midnight cry. The midnight cry is the light behind them. And said that it was not God that had led them out so far. The light behind them went out, leaving them their feet in perfect darkness, and they stumbled and lost sight of the mark of Jesus and fell off the path down into the dark and wicked world below. The midnight cry in this history arrives here. It's, it's also called in, in the pioneer history, if you're reading that, the seventh month movement. It's this experience of the Millerites that gives them a completely different view of the parable of the ten virgins. Miller's been preaching a specific view of the parable of the ten virgins up until this history, but when they get to the midnight cry, when the parable of the ten virgins is actually being fulfilled at the conclusion of that history, there's a whole new perspective of what the parable of the ten virgins represents. They all switch. Of course, William Miller is virtually the last man to accept that this new revelation of the midnight cry and the parable of the ten, ten virgins is true, but he does accept it. We're going to read you a quote just before October 22nd, 1844. 
But then over here, in this history, after 1844, Miller is going to reject that this here is true. And what happens if he does that? If he denies the light that was set up behind him, what happens? It goes out and he falls off the path. All right. First problem for William Miller, in terms of him, what he's typifying, is that he trusted men. The second problem is he reached a point where he rejected the midnight cry, the manifestation of the power of God that typifies and points forward to the latter rain. Okay. Miller rejecting the midnight cry is prefiguring those of us at the end of the world that reject the message of the latter rain. And the reason we do so is because when the message comes, we will have developed experience that's based upon following men and listening to what they say. I, the last time I was here, the last time I was here, a well-known lady in Adventism was here, and, and I knew her husband, but I didn't know her, so she arranged a meeting, and over there in the cafeteria we have a, had a meeting, and I knew that she was really worried about her husband getting drawn in to this message. And I sensed after the conversation that I was correct about what I knew. She's thinking that this is probably some kind of fanaticism and delusion. Do, do you know what the first comment she gave me was when we started talking? She says, are there any men in the general conference that believe these things like you do? Uh, I don't remember what I said. I was trying to, trying to be a low, low power. I'm not pointing my fingers at her. I'm saying that is the mentality in Adventism that has been bred over the past, since 1888 at least, perhaps before that. We were already out of the way before 1888. We were already questioning whether the entire Bible was inspired, if, whether you realize that or not, before 1888. And we were already questioning whether Sister Wright was inspired. That all, those controversies in Adventism preceded 1888. So when we got out of the way, you know, in this room, you've probably had a similar experience in Adventism as I, if, or, or not, if you've been to short time, but if you've been in Adventist as long as I have, you remember hearing the stories when people refer about the time when Adventism, Adventists were known as the, the people of the book? Remember that? We think back, oh, there was a time when we were the people of the book, and, and we think, that's good. We don't want to be the people of the book, brothers and sisters. That was, that was already in to a time period where we'd lost our way. Adventists aren't called to be the people of the book. Shortly after, shortly after 1844, Sister White has to rebuke the pastors because the way they're raising up Adventist churches is they're going in town and they're setting up a debate with all the pastors, the Protestant pastors. Come out, let's have a debate. And they were the people of the book. They could cut those Protestant pastors up, chew them up, spit them out, and before the they'd have a group of people to raise up an Adventist church. And Sister White says that's wrong. They were the people of the book. We're not supposed to be the people of the book. We're supposed to be people of prophecy. Brothers and sisters, prophecy is what started this movement. Prophecy is what finishes this movement. And somewhere in that history, when we became the people of the book, we turned prophecy into a doctrine. And we think prophecy is a doctrine. Prophecy is not a doctrine. Prophecy is a bright and shining light that grows brighter and brighter as the end of the world approaches. We can't simply be the people of the book that know the doctrines. We have to be the people that take the book and eat it. It becomes part of us. It guides us. It directs us. It changes us. But we're so long, we're far down in the stream of time that when we hear the old timers talking about, I can remember when we were people of the book, we think that's okay. We need to go back to this history and realize that these people weren't the people of the book. They were people of prophecy. Not only were they identified in prophecy, they were being guided by prophecy. It wasn't a doctrine. It was a power. And I want you to go way off track there. Like, early writings, page 257, William Miller denies the midnight cry. My attention was then called to William Miller. At length, William Miller raised his voice against the light from heaven. What was the light from heaven? The midnight cry. He failed in not receiving the message which would have fully explained his disappointment and cast a light and glory on the past, which would have revived his exhausted energies, brightened his hope, and led him to glorify God. If William Miller could have seen the light of the third angel's message, many things which looked dark and mysterious to him would have been explained. Now, in the middle of the next paragraph, it says, So also, 
I saw that William Miller erred as he was soon to enter the heavenly Canaan in suffering the influence, his influence to go against the truth. Others led him to to this. Others must account for it. So when we're looking at William Miller as a type of the end of the world, his first mistake was trusting men. This led him to reject the midnight cry, which prepared him to receive the mark of the beast. Now in the next quote, Sister Wright starts, she says, today is in the days of Elijah, and we've already, sh last night we showed that Sister, that Sister White clearly identifies Miller as a type of Elijah, so the type of, of this history here is an Elijah history. Miller was an Elijah, and we also read the quotes, it's in your notes, where the 144,000 are a type of Elijah. So she's taking us to Elijah histories to teach us something about Elijah. Next page, I've run out of time. The next, quote, the le next part of the quote on the top of page 24, speaking of this Elijah history, she says that she's teaching us that in the Elijah history there is a progressive testing process. She says the time is not far distant when the test will come to every soul. What's the test for Adventism? Sunday law. Sunday law. And unfortunately, that's what Adventists understand, and that's, that's true. But Adventists don't understand that prophecy clearly marks out that there's a three-step process that you must go through. The th Sunday law is simply the third test. Okay, but even if you don't identify and emphasize what those three are, the process that leads to the Sunday law is a progressive testing process. She says, the observance of the false Sabbath will be urged upon us. The contest will be, be between the commandments of God and the commandments of men. Those who have yielded what? Step by step. It's a progressive testing process to worldly demands and conformity to worldly customs will then yield to the powers that be rather than subject themselves to derision, insult, threatened imprisonment, and death. At that time, the gold will be separated from the dross. Now notice, in, under a parallel passage from Testimonies, Volume 5, page 80 to 82, and that was Prophets and Kings 187, but from Testimonies, Volume 5, she's going to talk about the, the same thing. If you drop down to the second paragraph, she says, the time is not far distant when the test will come to every soul. The mark of the beast will be urged upon us. Those who have yielded step by step. This is a parallel passage. But let's start at the first paragraph. The last passage, she refers to the Elijah time period, speaks about a testing process, and tells us it's progressive, step by step. She's going to say the same thing here, but she's going to add something into what is accomplished in this step-by-step -step process. And William Miller also represents this. There's a change in leadership about to take place in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The days are fast approaching when there will be great perplexity and confusion. Satan clothed in angel ro robes will deceive, if possible, the very elect. There will be God's many and Lord's many. Every wind of doctrine will be blowing. Those who have rendered supreme homage to science falsely so-called will not be the leaders then before that time period arrives what were those leaders they were leaders <laughs> or she wouldn't say it that way she's talking about leadership here in this testing process there's a change that takes place those who have trusted in intellect genius and talent will not stand at the head of rank and file they did not keep pace with the light those who prove themselves unfaithful will not then be entrusted with the flock. Who's she speaking about? Who's entrusted with the flock today? The leadership. But just as the Millerite Elijah time was a progressive testing process, the 144,000 Elijah time will be a progressive testing process. And one of the things that's identified very convincingly in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy is that there's a change of leadership in this time period. They did not keep peace, pace with the light. Those who prove themselves unfaithful will not be then entrusted with the flock. In the last solemn work, few great men will be engaged. And I mean to say that too. There will be some Nicodemuses and some Joseph of Arimatheas. But the general statement is is the leadership of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is about to be removed. And in every generation, 
there is a shut door message and the shut door message is a solemn serious message and all those shut door messages from Noah Abraham Moses John the Baptist Elijah William Miller all of those shut door messages are pointing forward to the anti-type of all of them the climax the conclusion of all those shut door messages is in this generation and there's going to be a change in leadership as there was in all of those other generations there are they are self-sufficient independent of God and he cannot use them the Lord has faithful servants who in the shaking testing time will be disclosed to view there are precious ones now hidden who have not bowed the knee to Baal. so she's talking about Elijah okay go to the top of the next page the seeds of truth still in the same passage from testimonies volume 5 the, the seeds of truth that are being sown by missionary efforts will then spring up and blossom and bear fruit souls will receive the truth who will endure tribulation and praise God that they may suffer for Jesus in the world you shall have tribula tribulation be of good cheer but be of good cheer I have overcome the world when the overflowing scourge shall pass through the earth that's the Sunday law in Bible prophecy when the fan is purging Jehovah's floor God will be the help of his people the trophies of Satan may be exalted on high but the faith of the pure and the holy will not be daunted Elijah took Elisha from the plow and threw upon him his mantle of consecration there's going to be a change how was William Miller called we read it last night he was called as Elisha okay She's, the calling of William Miller was the calling of Elisha and here she's talking about the calling and who was William Miller was he one of the major theologians of his day and age was he a pastor was he a leader a deist farmer didn't even know if he believed in the Bible the call Elijah took Elisha from the plow and threw upon him his mantle of conquer consecration the call to this great and solemn work was presented to men of learning and position had these been little in their own eyes and trusted fully in the Lord he would have honored them with bearing his standard in triumph to the victory but they separated from God yielded to the influence of the world and the Lord what rejected them now this is in the story of Elijah which sister white uses to illustrate the Millerite history and our history but sister white also compares our history and the Millerite history with John the Baptist is this something that happened in the history of John the Baptist but this is a hard one to swallow is it not <laughs> many have exalted science and lost sight of the God of science this is not the case with the church in the purest time God will work a work in our day that but few anticipate he will raise up and exalt among us those who are taught rather by the unction of his holy of his spirit than by the outward training of scientific institutions these facilities facilities are not to be despised or condemned they are ordained of God but they can furnish only the exterior qualifications God will manifest that he is not dependent on learned self-important mortals Amen. now in the next quote from early writings it says as the church refused to receive the first angel message that's right here 1842 first angel's message is being brought by Miller in this history the first angel's message is empowered on August 11th 1820 and by June of 1842 the churches have refused the first angel's message what caused them to close the door this right here this right here it was introduced in May of 1842 and you can read William Miller's comments William Miller says up to that time he had never said 1843 with certainty he says if my calculations are correct the Lord should return sometime around 1843 and he didn't know if it was gonna be a little bit before or a little bit after he says but in this time period the other Millerite preachers came to him and said brother Miller take the if out of your presentations and when brother Miller is telling this story when he says they told him to take the if out of his presentation he takes the word if and he puts it in capital letters with quotation marks around it to make sure you understand that they were saying take the if out of your presentation it's not 
he may return in 1843, he's returning in 1843. And Miller's describing that the brethren did this to him. This chart was produced in May of 1842, and then Miller goes on to describe that it's at this point that the churches turned against the message and began to call it a delusion. So when you're lining up these histories, shortly after the angel came down in August of 1840, this chart was introduced into the history right here. And it is the catalyst that closed the door right here. So what we're saying is, Shortly after the angel came down on September 11th, 2001, God began to return his people to the foundations of Adventism, taking them to these charts. And therefore, this door is about to close. Right? <laughs> you'll, s you'll see more of that as we go on. Um, but on this quote from early writings, they refused the first angel's message. Now drop down to the very last sentence of the last paragraph of early writings, page 237. It says, the most spiritual received this message first. And she's talking about the midnight cry. She just quoted the statement, behold, the bridegroom cometh. Though the most spiritual received this message first, and those who had formerly led in the work were the last to receive and help swell the cry, behold, the midnight, behold, the bridegroom cometh. As they come to the Exeter camp meeting and receive the message of the midnight cry, and they go out and proclaim in the very words of scriptures, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, those that had formerly led in the, word, the, the work prior to the midnight cry. Who was the leader prior to the midnight cry? William Miller. They were the last to receive the call, the cry, the message. William Miller is also identifying that as a leader, as representing a leader in this history, he doesn't get on board with the message. Notice the next quote. This is William Miller. Notice this is written October 6th, 1844. How many days until October 22nd? 16. Just a little bit over two weeks. Before this, the midnight cry has already been going on, full speed ahead. It's sweeping across the country. In fact, you're almost at the point in time, a couple of days before October 22nd, 1844, they stopped. They figured, we did it. The Lord's going to return in a couple of days. So just before the end, here's what William Miller writes to Brother Himes. Dear Brother Himes, I see a glory in the seventh month, which I have never saw before. Although the Lord had shown me the typical bearing of the seventh month, one year and a half ago, yet I did not realize the force of the types. Now, bless me the name of the Lord, I see a beauty, a harmony, and an agreement in the scriptures for which I have long prayed, but did not see until today. He did not see the validity of the midnight cry, the seventh month movement until 16 days before October 22nd, 1844. And Sister White says, those that formerly let out in the work were the last to receive it. And in this sense, William Miller is typifying the leadership that don't receive the message of the latter rain. Some of them will, but they'll get on board late if they do. A special testing message. In every age, there is a development of truth, a message of God to the people of that generation. Christ Object Lessons, page 127. The old truths are all essential. New truth is not independent of old, but an unfolding of it. It is only as the old truths are understood that we can comprehend the new. When Christ desired to open to his disciples the truth of his resurrection, he began at Moses and all the prophets and expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. But it is the light that shines in the fresh unfolding of truth that glorifies the old. He who rejects or neglects the new does not really possess the old. For him, it loses its vital power and becomes but a lifeless form. Now, brothers and sisters, in every generation, there's a special message. There was a special message in the time of the Millerites. There's going to be a special message at the end of the world. There was a speci special message. We dealt with this last night. In the time of Noah, Abraham, John the Baptist. 
there is one characteristic of that special message that is not wise, widely understood, and it's that the message is always a closed door message. The special message is a message identifying the closing of the door. Was Noah telling the world that probation's about to close? All these messages are prefiguring this message. But the message of John the Baptist, he looks, he looks at the leadership of the church and what's he say? Snakes and vipers who have warned you to flee from the wrath of come. And then Sister White, what does she say? We have a message that is more pointed than John the Baptist. Brothers and sisters, the shut door message, it's scary because it's saying probation's about to close, but it includes the truth that it's here at this shut door time period that the leadership, the structure, is swept away. Brothers and sisters, the structure of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, it's a corporation. It doesn't matter if every man that's on the payroll of the General Conference is as faithful as Enoch. When the Sunday law comes, if they all stand and say, we're upholding Sabbath, the government will shut the corporation down. It ends there. Or if there is apostate as Judas, it ends there. The structure ends at this closed door. And there's a new leadership that the Lord raises up. <laughs> Christ Object Lawsons, page 79. Not only is the growth of Christ's kingdom illustrated in the parable of the mustard seed, but in every stage of its growth, the experience represented in the parable is repeated. For his church in every generation, God has a special truth and a special work. That truth is hid from the worldly wise and prudent. It that the truth that is hid from the worldly wise and prudent is revealed to the childlike and humble. It calls for self-sacrifice. It has battles to fight and victories to win. And you don't win those victories if you don't get involved with the battles. And if you don't get involved with the battles, you don't get strong in this message. And you need to get strong in this message because this is the battle that all the other battles in sacred histories we're pointing forward to. There's a battle. You've got to be Nehemiah. You've got to have your work implement in this hand doing a work, but you have to have your weapon, your sword, or your spear in this hand because there's a war going on. And Sister White plainly says that we're all to be Nehemiahs. At the outset, its advocates are few. Read William Miller's first dream. That's part of that story. He was virtually at his end in that dream before the Lord brought Himes on and rejuvenated him. He'd been many years all by himself, basically. John the Baptist, crying in the wilderness, all by himself. How many people were there with Noah? By the great men of the world and by a world-confirming church, they are exposed and despised. See John the Baptist, the forerunner of Christ, standing alone to rebuke the pride and formalism of the Jewish nation. See the first bearers of the gospel into Europe. How obscure, how hopeless seemed the mission of Paul and Silas, the two tent makers, as they with their companions took ship at Troas for Philippi. See Paul the aged in chains, preaching Christ in the stronghold of imperial Rome. See Martin Luther withstanding the mighty church, which is the masterpiece of the world's wisdom. See him holding fast God's word against emperor and pope, declaring, here I take my stand, I can not do otherwise. God be my help. See John Wesley preaching Christ and his righteousness in the midst of formalism, sensualism, and infidelity. See one burdened with the woes of the heathen world, pleading for the privilege of carrying to them Christ's message of love. Hear the response of ecclesiasticism. Sit down, young man. When God wants to convert the heathen, he will do it without your help or mine. Now, <laughs> I've seen that spirit, but I actually, in the past, I don't, <laughs> don't remember how long ago, past couple years, probably less, had a, a conference pastor tell me point blank, and I'm, I've seen this spirit, but it's usually not expressed directly. He said, 
if this message is valid, when the, a message like this is to arrive, it will come from the General Conference and it will be in what I, li what I like to call the Review and Herald, but now they call it the Adventist world. And that's what he said, point blank. He said, down young man, when God wants to convert the heathen, he will do it without your help or mine. The great leaders of religious thought in this generation sound the praises and build the monuments of those who planted the seeds of truth centuries ago. Do not many turn from this work to trample down the growth springing from the same seed today? The old cry is repeated. We know that God spake unto Moses, as for this fellow, Christ, in the messenger he sends. There could be a messenger sent in this generation. Christ, in the messenger he sends, we know not from whence he is. As in earlier ages, the special truths for this time are found not with the ecclesiastical authorities, but with men and women who are not too learned or too wise to believe the word of God. The messenger he sends, hopefully, are sitting in this room. Next quote, rather long quote, Review and Herald, February 18th, 1890. Brothers and sisters, the point, one of the points that, that I'm trying to make here, this message that comes, this final message, the third angel's message that first confronts Adventism and then goes to the world, this message, this is the message that every other message pointed forward to. Follow that? All the prophets are speaking about the end of the world. This message is absolutely bulletproof. It's airtight. There, any of God's message are perfect without flaw. All, all sacred history shows that. But this message at the end, this one, it's, it's without, there's no way to tear this message down. Now why am I emphasizing that? Because whether it's in the church or in the world, there is an understanding that worldlings and Christians have about a message. You know what the message is, whether it's in the church or the world? If you can't beat the message, attack the messenger. All right? Meaning, there's a lot of messages in Adventism today. That's what Jeremiah is saying in, in verse 16 of chapter 6. Stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths. In Adventism, there's a lot of ways, but we're to find the old way, the old path. There's a lot of voices in Adventism today, a lot of teachings. But the final warning message that confronts Adventism, the latter rain message, the shut door message, it will be marked in Adventism. It will be recognized by Adventism that this message is the one that's causing all the trouble. This is the message that has to be dealt with because that's what's illustrated in all these histories. There will have to be some kind of label put on this message. It will become the point of controversy in Adventism. The Jews tried to stop the proclamation of the message that had been predicted in the word of God, but prophecy must be fulfilled. The Lord says, Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Oh. Somebody is to come in the spirit and power of Elijah, and when he appears, men may say, You are too earnest. You do not interpret the scriptures in the proper way. Let me tell you how to teach your message. There are many who cannot distinguish between the work of God and that of man. I shall tell you the truth as God gives it to me, and I say now, if you continue to find fault, to have a spirit of variance, you will never know the truth. Jesus said to his disciples, I have yet many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. They were not in a condition to appreciate the sacred and eternal things, but Jesus promised to send the Comforter who would teach them all things and bring all things to their remembrance whatsoever he had said unto them. Brethren, we must not put our dependence in what? We must not be like William Miller. We must not put our dependence in men. See she for man whose breath is in his nostrils, for wherein is he to be accounted of? You must hang your helpless souls upon Jesus. It does not become us to drink from the fountain of the valley when there is a fountain in the mountain. 
Let us leave the lower streams. Let us come to the higher springs. If there is a point of truth that you do not understand, upon which you do not agree, investigate. Compare scripture with scripture. Sink the shaft of truth down deep into the mind of God's word. You must lay yourselves and your opinions on the altar of God. Put away your preconceived ideas and let the spirit of heaven guide you into all truth. My brother, this is her, her genuine physical brother. My brother said at one time that he would not hear anything concerning the doctrine we hold for fear he should be convinced. I know people that have expressed that to me too. I have a that what you guys are teaching is correct. I'm staying away because I don't want to be held accountable for it. He would not come to the meetings or listen to the discourses, but he afterward declared that he saw that he was guilty as if he had heard them. God had given him opportunity to know the truth, and he would hold him responsible for this opportunity. There are many among us who are, pr who are prejudiced against the doctrines that we are now being discussed. They will not come to hear. They will not calmly investigate, but they put forth their objections in the dark. In the dark. Where's the dark? <laughs> they are perfectly satisfied with their position. They, thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salves that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chase, and be zealous therefore and repent. This scripture applies to those who live under the sound of this message but who will not come to hear it. How do you know but that the Lord is giving fresh evidences of his truth, placing it in a new setting that the way of the Lord may be prepared? What plans have you been laying that new light may be infused through the ranks of God's people? What evidence have you that God has not sent light to his children? All self-sufficiency, egotism, and pride of opinion must be put away. We must come to the feet of Jesus and learn of him who is meek and lowly of heart. Jesus did not teach his disciples as the rabbis taught theirs. Many of the Jews came and listened as Christ revealed the mysteries of salvation, but they came not to learn. They came to criticize, to catch him in some inconsistency, that they might have something with which to prejudice the people. We were out here the last time, and from here, we went to Loma Linda, or vice versa, whether we were in Loma, Loma Linda second, and there was a, a couple of brothers in the back of the, the meeting at Loma Linda with their laptops. And some of us, not me, I was, I was speaking, but some of us that are into this message kind of strolled behind during the meeting and watched what was going on on their laptops. And all they were doing is listening and finding little points that they thought they could prove what was being taught was there. They were just, they were just there as the spies. <laughs> so, and there's people here that, that can give you a second testimony of that. Nothing new under the sun. Nothing new under the sun. They were content with their knowledge, but the children of God must know the voice of the true shepherd. It's not, is not this a time when it would be highly proper to fast and pray before God? We are in danger of variance, in danger of taking sides on a controverted point, and should, not, should we not seek God in earnestness with humiliation of soul that we may know what is truth? Brothers and sisters, this message is going to be associated with, it's going to be identified in Adventism, but this message is bulletproof. They're going to have to come after the messengers. It's going to be labeled, it's going to be identified. That's why in Jeremiah and Ezekiel, when it's telling us about eating a little book, it says, I will make thy forehead hard as flint. There's going to be a shaking over this message. All the shakings of sacred history point forward to this shaking. And now that the Lord is emphasizing that the special message for this generation is a shut door message, and that that shut door message includes the fact that the Lord is about to purge his church, the message is going to get much more serious. Now that you can see in the society, the culture of Adventism, men that are directly pointing to these truths and saying, we will not walk therein, at that point, when they're doing it publicly, 
then you have to respond in order to allow those that are under their influence to have an opportunity to hear the other side of the story. At that point, the shaking begins in earnest. The shaking's already underway. So notice, who is the message, messenger? Miller and those. As John the Baptist heralded the first advent of Jesus and prepared the way for his coming, so William Miller and what? And those who joined with him proclaimed the second advent of the Son of God. John came in the spirit and power of Elijah to proclaim the first advent of Jesus. I was pointed down to the last days and saw that John represented those who should go forth in the spirit and power of Elijah to herald the day of wrath and the second advent of Christ. Brothers and sisters, one of the qu this quote that Brother Dario started with last night, I've used portions of that quote for years, but he took the whole quote. And there was a passage in that quote that just, it just overwhelms me. It's talking about watchmen and Adventism. You have the quote in your materials. It's on page, uh, the part I want to read is on page 75. In the middle of the page, you'll see a sentence there all by itself. If you go up above that, where we can start to put it into a little bit of context, page 75, in the middle of the page, is the sentence where the punchline is, but the sentence before that says, those who reject the spirit of truth place themselves under the control of a spirit that is opposed to the word and work of God. For a time, they may continue to teach some phase of truth, but their refusal to accept all the light God sends will after a time place them where they will do the work of a false watchman. It's not talking about people that are teaching error in Adventism. It's talking about people that are teaching truth in Adventism. If they don't get on this message, and that message about four sentences further down is defined as God bids us to give our time and strength to the work of preaching to the people the messages that stirred the men and women in 1843 and 1844. It don't matter what truth you're teaching in Adventism in this time period because this is the time of our visitation. It don't matter what truth you're teaching. If you're not putting your time and energy into teaching the foundational truths in order to establish the capstone truths, the final truth, the loud cry, then you end up a false watchman. Therefore, those people that get on board with this message, they have to be in unity with this message. And the Bible says they will be. And the spirit of prophecy says they will be. Back to page 28 of your notes. From Isaiah 52, 7 through 8, it says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings. What are the good tidings? It's the last six verses of Daniel 11. Tidings out of the east and the north. How beautiful are those that bring this closed door message at the end of the world that publish peace, that bringeth good tidings of good. Now, how do you know that this is the last six verses of Daniel 11? Very simply, brothers and sisters, the last six verses of Daniel 11 lead to, to the time where when Michael stands up, human probation closes. Therefore, the history that precedes the close of human probation is the history of Laodicea. And in the history of Laodicea, that's when the Holy Spirit is poured out. And the Holy Spirit is poured out in Revelation 18, and the general message of Revelation 18 in verse 2 is Babylon has fallen, has fallen. And when you see a phrase or a word repeated in the scriptures, it is marking either the second or the fourth angel's message. And you'll notice there it says, bringeth good tidings, bringeth good tidings. This is the latter rain time period. This is the time period of the last six verses of Daniel 11. This is the tidings that come out of the east and north in verse 44 of Daniel 11. The watchmen that give this message shall lift up the voice. With voice together they shall sing, for they shall see what? Eye to eye when the Lord shall bring again Zion. Break forth into joy, sing together, ye waste places of Jerusalem, for the Lord hath comforted his people. What's it mean to comfort? Who's the comforter? The Lord has poured out his spirit upon his people. He hath redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of God. Depart ye, depart.
were e babylon is fallen babylon is fallen this is the latter rain message and those people that proclaim the latter rain message see eye to eye now in the next quote sister white's talking about unity and she concludes from reviewing herald may 12 1903 quoting what we just read okay we're going to pass over that to as john I'm on page 29, and I'm running out of time. The preaching of the word is not to be undervalued. To preach the grand and solemn truths of the gospel, which is to save men's soul, is sac a sacred and holy work. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publish peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publish salvation, that saith unto, saith unto Zion, thy God reigneth. When an honor is conferred upon men who are called to be laborers together with God, as John, they are to be messengers to proclaim the coming of Christ. John, we mentioned this last night. John proclaimed the coming of Christ when Christ came to the heavenly sanctuary. Miller proclaimed the coming of Christ when Christ came to the most holy place. Both of those histories are pointing forward to this history when Christ comes to the judgment of the living. When Christ came to the holy place in the time of John, he marked that change of dispensation with his spirit being poured out. When Miller announced the coming of Christ to the most holy place, that was marked with his spirit being poured out at the midnight cry. The marking of the judgment of the living is the spirit being poured out starting at September 11, 2001. The shut door message, words of the little flock. I saw that the Holy Sabbath is and will be the separating wall between the true Israel of God and unbelievers, and that the Sabbath is the great test question to unite the hearts of God's dear waiting saint, and if one believed and kept the Sabbath and received the blessing attended it, and then gave it up and broke the Holy Covenant, they would shut the gates of the Holy City against themselves as sure as there was a God that rules in heaven above. Right here, Sunday Law in the United States. Two shut doors in the Millerite history, shut door here. Shut door here. Two shut doors in this history. Shut door here on God's people. Shut door here on, on all of mankind. Two shut doors in both history. Shut doors are marking the conclusion of the, the cleansing of the temple in both those histories. I saw that God has children who do not see and keep the Sabbath. They had not rejected their light on it. And at the commencement of the time of trouble, we were filled with what? The Holy Ghost. And she goes on to explain that this isn't the time of trouble when the plagues are poured out. This is this time of trouble that we call the little time of trouble. that begins at the Sunday law in the United States and continues till Michael stands up. During this time period, we were filled with the Holy Ghost because here the latter rain is sprinkling. But here the church is purified and then the Holy Spirit is poured out without measure. This enraged the church and the nominal Adventists if they could not refute the Sabbath truth. This time, God's chosen all saw clearly that we had the truth and they came out and endured persecution with us. I have to get through this. Adventism is tested first. All right? Adventism is tested first. And it's here that the structure is removed at the Sunday law. And it's here that there's a change in leadership. And it's here that you mark the shut door. And it's Daniel 11, 40 and 41 and 12, 1 that is the shut door message for this time period. Adventism is judged first. Notice the next quote from Selected Messages, book 3, page 154. A new heart will I give you, a new spirit will I put within you. I believe with all my heart that the spirit of God is being withdrawn from the, from the world. And those who have had great light and opportunities, who are that? Seventh-day Adventists, and have not improved them, will be the first to be left. By who? The Holy Spirit. Again, this is strong delusion. This is paralleling the Jews being in perfect darkness when they flunked the test in their history. This is the Protestants praying to, the, to Satan in the Millerite history. This is the strong delusion that takes place in Adventism at the Sunday Law. 
they have grieved away the spirit of God. The present activity of Satan in the working upon hearts and upon churches and nations should startle every student of prophecy. The end is near. Let our churches arise. Let the converting power of God be experienced in the heart of individual members. And then we shall see the deep movings, moving of the spirit of God. Do you have the deep moving of the spirit of God in your life? There's what you need to do, as you just said. Mere forgiveness of sin is not the sole result of the death of Jesus. He made the infinite sacrifice not only that sin might be removed, but that human nature might be restored, rebeautified, reconstructed from its ruins, and made fit for the presence of God. 1 Peter 4, 17, judgment begins with Adventism. Now notice this. Darius has been dealing with Ezekiel, all right? This is right out of the chapters that he's going to deal with this weekend. She's commenting here on Ezekiel 9. She says, this is great controversy, 656. The mark of deliverance has been set upon those that sigh and cry for all the abominations to be done. Now the angel of death goes forth, represented in Ezekiel's vision by the men with the slaughter weapons to whom the command is given, slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my, what? Sanctuary. Says the prophet, this prophet they began at the ancient men which were before the house. The ancient men. The leadership. The work of destruction, destruction begins among those who have pre professed to be the spiritual guardians of the people. The false watchmen are the first to fall. There are none to pity or to spare. Men, women, maidens, and little children perish together. Now in Testimonies, volume 5, page 211, still speaking about the same passage in Ezekiel, she says, here we see that the church, the Lord's sanctuary, was the first to feel the stroke of the wrath of God. The ancient men, those to whom God had given great light and who had stood as guardians of the spiritual interests of the people, had betrayed their trust. Was Sister White a prophet? They had taken the position that we need not look what? No notice is underlined this. They had taken the position that we need not look for miracles and the marked manifestation of God's power as in the Millerite movement. And what was the marked manifestation of God's power in the Millerite movement? It was the midnight cry. Amen. They deny the midnight cry. They've built up an experience where they trust in themselves and they teach those under their influence to trust them as well. And they reach a point just before the slaughtering angel comes through to where what is noted by inspiration of them is that they had taken the position that we need not look for miracles in the marked manifestation of the power of God as in former days. Times have changed. These words strengthen their unbelief, and they say, the Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. These words strengthen their unbelief, and they say that, that, that he is too merciful to visit his people in judgment. There isn't any closed-door message. Thus, peace and safety is a cry from men who will never again lift up their voice like a trumpet to show God's people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. These dumb dogs that would not bark are the ones who feel the just vengeance of an offended God. Men, maidens, and little children perish together. The marked manifestation of the power of God that William Miller denied was the midnight cry, and it prepared him for rejecting the third angel's message typifying those that received the mark of the beast at the end of the world. William Miller made these poor choices in a shut-door controversy that was taking place in that history. He first trusted in men, then he rejected the mighty manifestation of the power of God. Then he rejected the third angel's message. We are now in the shut door controversy. How do you understand the last six verses of Daniel 11? And there's a controversy in Adventism going on. And there's two groups in Adventism, both represented by William Miller. One group has learned to trust in the wisdom of other men. And those men that they're trusting reach the point, according to Sister White's commentary on Ezekiel 8 and 9, where they reject the midnight cry, the manifestation of God's power. And they do this just before the Sunday law. And because they're false watchmen, the blood of all those souls that they did not warn will be on their garments. And Sister White is clear that she understood the midnight cry was to be repeated. She says, my mind was carried to the future when the signal will be given. Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him. But 
Some will have delayed to obtain the oil for replenishing their lamps, and too late they find that character, which is represented by the oil, is not transferable. Brothers and sisters, <laughs> you're an Adventist. You're going to, you, you have the prophetic DNA of William Miller. And you're going to be William Miller one way or the other. You're either going to receive the mark of the beast or the seal of God. You're either going to take up this message even though you don't think you are the one to take up this message and begin to carry it to Israel and make it your own and have an experience with it where it changes you. Or you're going to continue to trust in human beings and get to the point where in this testing time right now, did the latter rains begin on September 11, 2001? This is the question mark. This is the rejection of the midnight cry. The midnight cry is what prefigures the latter rain. We're already at the point in time where the second step of William Miller is, is being agitated. Do you believe this is the repetition of the Millerite history? Do you believe this is the repetition of the midnight cry? Because if you deny that, you fall off the path. And shortly thereafter, you reject the third angel's message and receive the mark of the beast. Shall we pray? <laughs> Heavenly Father, we understand that we're living in very serious times. But as Laodiceans, our spiritual discernment is not in tune with the, the implication of these serious times. We ask that you would do what it takes in each of our individual experiences to awaken us to our personal responsibility on how to take this message, consume it, make it part of our own experience, and begin the work of, of bumping our, our heads against a people that will not receive this message. We understand that this is ordained for our benefit, but it seems a difficult calling. We ask that you give us the courage to take up that task, that we might develop the spiritual muscle now that we, that we need to have when we're going to fi find ourselves in a time when every human support is cut off during a Sunday law crisis. We know that this experience of carrying this message to a church that will not hear is designed to prepare us for that time. Don't let us be sleeping virgins in the time, the little time that we have left to prepare this experience and prepare this character, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.